Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Tech Talk. I'm Peter Zemsky. Um, and we're going to be talking to one of the world's most innovative and creative experts on tech strategy. So Ron um, is back in his native US as a professor at Tuck, but he's an old friend of INSEAD. Um, he spent his first decade um, as a professor here, very influential colleague for many of us um, doing tech strategy at INSEAD. Um, he won, in his 10 years, he won the MBA teaching prize for best elective an amazing five times, partly because he's a, a great communicator with, with great stories, great examples, but also I think fundamentally always pushing the edge, fresh um, content, his own perspectives on fundamental strategy issues. Um, so Ron, come on out and uh, show yourself and welcome back to INSEAD, at least virtually. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's, it's, it's such a delight to be, to be back, um, virtually, but still back. Um, I'm, uh, I have to say, like looking at the list of participants, I see some familiar names and friends, and it's just, uh, it's a delight to be able to, to be back and, and, and to share some of your ideas. Great. Um, it's always good to have a conversation with you, Ron, but especially I think we're privileged this week as you're coming out with a new book, um, your second big book. So I got, why don't we just drive wide in, um, winning the right game. What's, what's the meaning of the title as we get into this? I don't know if you remember, but there was a moment in time when GE was General Electric was regarded as one of the premier companies in the world. And there was a moment in time where the guy who ran GE, um, I just shared the, the, the cover, the guy who ran GE, Jack Welch, uh, was regarded as the best CEO in the world. And he wrote this great book called Winning. And in some ways, that's what it was about. All you needed to do was win. Okay, you're in an industry, be number one or number two, lower your costs, increase your quality. That's what it was about. And the implication of this title is that actually today's environment, winning the right game is supposed to evoke the notion that, you know, there's more than one game being played and you might actually be choosing to play the wrong one, in which case winning the wrong game is the same as losing. Um, and that's the, that's the context in which we have to think about strategy today. And that's the, that's the core of what's behind this book is how do we revisit this world where the industry guidance that we used to have no longer fits quite as well. And you'd had, you know, your, your, your wide lens book really captured a lot of, of the essence of what you bring to thinking uh, broadly about an ecosystem. What sort of triggered you in the last few years to say, hey, I, I want to bring out a new book in this area? Um, well, so, you know, wide lens was, was actually, wide lens was, was, was prepared and cooked at INSEAD, um, right? That was the, the heart of what I taught. And again, look, part of the delight of having so many people join is I learned so much from the opportunity of being able to teach this stuff at INSEAD. And so wide lens kind of captured this notion of, as you're trying to drive new growth, as you're trying to innovate, when is it that you need to look beyond the usual, your, your straight line to the customer, beyond your customer insight, beyond just competitive advantage? Um, it came out and really helped my own thinking, but then a whole new line of questions opened up, which was, if people are innovating in this way, what does that mean for the way in which they're going to compete? And so the, the, the heart of Wide Lens was how do you rethink innovation in a context of ecosystems? This book was about, okay, if you've innovated or the people around you are innovating in this way, how do you rethink the way you compete in this kind of environment? In some ways, really taking you into the heart of strategy, right? In terms of the, how you compete. Okay, what's great about you, Ron, is you've got you know, the, big, the big thinking and then you've got you know, examples that really let us understand what's going on in your head. So could you start out and maybe just share with us one of the, the great examples from the book about you know what does this mean? Why why have we gone from winning to winning the right game? Um, yeah, so let me let, let, let me let me frame it for us. Um, so if we think about like a, a classic context for strategy, okay. So here's a car, and um, when we think about cars, we think about the production of cars, we think about supply chains, we think about kind of the classic industry analysis that we would think about is, all right, we've got quarters, five forces, 
buyer power, supplier power, entry, substitutes, they're going to tell us something about how much money these guys are going to be able to capture as they're making these vehicles. And so they're thinking about rivalry, right? This is like strategy 1.0 industry analysis. Then we had um, a wave of thinking which said, you know, with this courtesy of Clay Christensen and disruptive technologies that said, you know, sometimes there are rivals that come in that you miss, right? These sneaky, stealthy, disruptive players like to Toyota was in the 70s or Lexus was in the 90s, which they come in with what is perceived as an inferior offer, but then they get good enough and then they surprise you and they change competition. And that was this big step that we had. Um, and today, I think this is like bread and butter in the C-suite, bread and butter in the MBA core. And all of it is, by the way, absolutely correct and absolutely important. Um, and it's so well understood, by the way, that when it was the Chinese that started thinking about doing cars, everybody saw that a mile away. And Volvo goes into China and you know Ford goes into China. Buick is like a top brand in China. That's, a, that's, a, that's an indicator of how good we are at seeing these kinds of threats. Um, so this is what competition in the car industry looks like. And then we have Tesla comes in and Tesla says, you know, we're going to make electric cars. And in the beginning, the sense is, okay, it's a car. It's got a motor instead of an engine, batteries. GM and Ford are not particularly impressed. Okay, GM made the EV1 in 1986. They make the Volt, the Bolt. Nissan makes the Leaf. We know how to make cars we can compete. And then something happens, which is Tesla starts adding other pieces. They add a charging network. And if you're Ford and GM, suddenly there's a question of, okay, we have charging partners. We're not gonna become Exxon, that's somebody else's job. But Tesla is integrating that charging network into the way you use the car. It's not just a place to plug in. And they're bringing in autonomy and they're putting these sensors in every car and using every car to build their algorithms, regardless of whether the driver has paid for autonomy or not. And they're bringing in power into the home. You can charge, you can generate power on your roof. And suddenly this is looking not, not like the game I'm used to playing. And then these new players are coming in. Okay, Uber, it's a taxi service. A taxi service that thinks that somehow it should be in autonomy, Baidu and Google, they do web search, but they're trying to become the brains of the car. Apple has an infinity of money. They're talking about it. And suddenly, hmm. if you're just talking about a car industry, it's clear that you're losing something and yet you're struggling to figure out, well, what do we do here? And by the way, the exemplar of this is, you know, Ford had four CEOs in their first 80 years as a company. They've had four CEOs in the last seven years, right? That's what it means when companies are struggling to redefine themselves themselves in this context. And that's, you know, that's the clarion call for, yeah, industry tools are important, but we need something to help us make sense of this, the right-hand side of this slide. Cool. Um, well, we should, let's put a tab on the leadership issue. Once we've explored the strategy issues, we can, we can pivot back to who you need to execute this and, and stuff, but let's, let's start with the basics. So yeah, you're throwing the ecosystem word out there, pretty central. Um, again, a little bit like disruption is, it's, it's, a, it's a very heavily used word. It's not clear that when people use it, they always mean the right, right, right thing or the same thing. Um, what definition do you find useful of ecosystem? How is it the same? How is it different than just an industry? Um, I, it's, it's a great question, right? Because ecosystem today is almost like a business comma. You're just throwing into a sentence. Um, and maybe it's worse than a comma because it adds confusion rather than giving you a pause to think. Um, my, so the way I think about ecosystems, my definition of what an ecosystem is, is that the ecosystem is the structure through which partners, a multilateral set of partners, interact to deliver a value proposition to an end consumer. And you know, when I wrote Wide Lens, what I had in my mind was, oh, this is all about interdependence. But one of my big ahas working on this book was interdependence is not the story. You could look at the car industry and you see it's vast and complex supply chain. That's a lot of interdependence. What makes the ecosystem construct salient 
is when you need, when in order to understand that interdependence, you can't just look at the buyer supplier relationships in that chain, right? You can't look at these dyadic relationships. It's when you're reconfiguring that structure that you need to think about the relationship between multiple actors simultaneously. When you're thinking about how to redraw the structure of interdependence, that this construct of an ecosystem becomes salient. When you're not trying to change the structure, the ecosystem is there, but it's in the background. You can focus on your usual industry logic, but when you're trying to realign these actors in pursuit of a new value proposition, that's where we need this new ecosystem approach. And just to play it out, it, are you saying though uncertainty is a big element? I understand new, new elements, new co competitors, but is, is there a sense in which there's an uncertainty difference? Well, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge difference in, uncertain, difference in uncertainty because in an industry, the uncertainty is really, it's about, you know, once we know what the proposition is and once we know, you know, you make the tires, you give them over to the car manufacturer, they sell, there's a question of, have you figured out what the price points are? Have you figured out what margins look like in the transaction? Is there going to be demand for it? In this ecosystem context, you have not just that, but in addition, this question of who's sitting where, who's touching the customer, right? Like, is it Uber that's providing the intelligence or is it Ford that's providing the intelligence in that vehicle? And so it's a different dimension of uncertainty that and that's why it requires a different kind of strategy, right? Strategy has always been decision-making under uncertainty. It's just that these ecosystems with their new configurations require us to think about a different kind of uncertainty. All right. So with Ron having clarified that, um, why don't we do one poll just to give Ron a sense of where, where you guys are at and, and the audience is at. So um, why don't we pull up a first poll just to see if you think about your primary context industry, um, what are you seeing? And again, one extreme is going to be you're living in that left-hand side. The boundaries are clear and stable. Um, you know, maybe there's a new geographic market like China, but you're, you're on that one. The other extreme would probably be mobility. Everything's being thrown up and up in the air. And again, we've given you two things on, on the edge. One is you could be leaning more towards stability, or you could actually really be seeing early movement towards a, a full ecosystem disruption. Um, so do pick one of those four. And, and so Ron will get a, a quick feedback on, on what the international INSEAD audience is experiencing. Uh, maybe correlated with book sales, Ron, we don't know, but. Uh, <laughs> all right, how are we? I don't, I actually, on the way this is set up, I'm not seeing the responses. So uh, Sandra, when you think we have uh, a good, enough set responses to get a sense, please review the poll bingo. Um, so again, Ron, so this is encouraging you know, only 4% of the people at least selecting on this call are in that happy uh, Portorian world, 24% um, are full on uh, disruption. And then the, the vast majority, though, this is an issue. Any, any reactions on your side? I think this is like this is this is where the world is. Right. And, and by the way, the problem with being in that second or third category is you're recognizing this. And the question is, when do you start acting, right? Because by the time it's clear that you're in that fourth category, it's probably a little too late to start. At the same time, you don't wanna start revving the engine if you don't have a clear idea of what to do. Um, and so, you know, look, so I would say <laughs> for book sales, 96% of the participants are, are thinking this is a book, I think this is a book you should read. And for the other four, maybe you want to double check, right? I mean, there's so much that's changing right now, right? It's like, we're at a point, we don't even know what money is anymore, right? The, 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 you know, the, the certainty of national currencies itself is up for grabs in this realignment. Um, it's, and, and by the way, this is all this, you can read this as like from a defensive perspective, this is terrible, right? This is going to be so much harder than working in industries on the other hand. You can say this is amazing because it's opening up all these new opportunities. Um, but in either case, you want to be thinking about this as, as proactively and preemptively as possible. All right. all right. So let's now exactly get get into what you've made sense of about how we how do we actually make strategy in this new domain? Maybe just, you know, what are the keys to building an effective ecosystem? 
Um, you know, Steve Jobs, I'll, I'll push on one of many dimensions, though. Obviously, this is 10 years since Steve Jobs passed. He had many um, contributions, but he beat into everyone's head customer focus, customer focused innovation. Um, how does that play out? Is that the guiding light for this new, new ecosystem strategy? It, so, you know, I anchor this notion of an ecosystem and the idea of the value proposition for the end consumer. So customer insight clearly is key. Um, however, I'm going to suggest that that is, it's necessary. And not only is it far from sufficient, I think that we're actually trapped in a world where we think that it's that the uniqueness of things is the value proposition. When in fact, what you see is so many firms trying to offer basically the same proposition and the, the difference between success and failure is often not, oh, they got the idea wrong. It's they just couldn't pull it together in the right way. And in not doing so, we then often say, oh, well, they just thought about it wrong. But I think there's actually, a much clearer explanation and much more actionable set of steps that we can pursue to increase the likelihood of success. So propositions are important, but they're just the starting point. They're not the end goal. And so when you're thinking about the kind of tools you need, you said, okay, yeah, classic five forces sort of stuff has its place, but where do you, what kind of gaps do you see then um, in, in our traditional strategy toolkit? Um, all right, I'm going to use that as an opportunity to give you a, like a walk through what my, so how, how do I think about the, the, the way to approach ecosystem strategy? And I should, I should be really clear. So when I think about ecosystem strategy, ecosystem strategy is alignment strategy. It's how do you pursue a new proposition and figure out how to get other people to work with you in order to create that proposition because you're doing it outside of the context of the existing su supply chain relationships. So I'm gonna walk you through kind of the, the, the structure of the argument, which also happens to be the structure of the book, which is the first thing is we need a new way of seeing what disruption looks like. That it's not just this low cost entrant that's coming in. It's not just a substitution in technology. It's a reconstruction of the value proposition, right? And that's like the misunderstanding that I think many of the traditional car makers are still displaying in their investment choices as they're pursuing electric cars, as though the problem was making the car versus what you see these, you know, more interesting electric players, not just Tesla, right? But, you know, Neo with their battery switch stations. Um, there's a company in Canada that actually announced an electric car that while it's parked, they will use the processing power in the car to mine Bitcoin. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but it's clearly thinking about what you get out of vehicle in a very different way than can I make batteries and manage my supply chain? So we need to start with rethinking ecosystem disruption. Um, by the way, we have to think about ecosystem, right? So when we, we think about ecosystems, we think about big players, obviously, Apple, Google, um, Amazon. Um, I think a critical second step is if you're in business today, you have to think about when these guys move into my space, how do I respond? Right? So you have to think about ecosystem defense. And actually, the cases in the book, I think you'll, you'd enjoy, like these are, you know, how is Spotify still alive given Apple's full force attack on music streaming before Spotify had two nickels to rub together, right? So you need principles for defense. You need principles for but how do you become a disruptor of this source? And, you know, I, 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 I'll give you the example of, of the Amazon uh, Echo and Alexa in, 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 in a couple of minutes, but this is not just a new company game, right? There's a great example you know, I, that I found so interesting about Asa Abloy. Asa Abloy is a hundred year old manufacturer of locks and keys that has transformed itself into a guardian of digital identity. Um, this is not just a game for Silicon Valley startups. Um, you have to think about timing, right? So, you know, GM with electric cars in the 1980s was an early mover, but sometimes you can be way too early. Um, you have to think about leadership and leadership here is at the level of the company. Like, can you, are you going to lead an ecosystem or are you better off as a follower in an ecosystem? And there's a, a whole discussion of what smart followership looks like. Um, and also the individuals who lead these kinds of initiatives. Um, we can talk about this later, but the, the, the characteristic that you should look for and develop in the leaders that you're looking to run these organizations are actually quite different in an ecosystem setting than a industry setting. And then finally, perhaps most importantly, in a strategy context, 
having the right strategy is barely a start if you need to align an organization to pursue it. And so I think in some ways that everything in the book you can think of as, and I didn't, I didn't show the pictures of the frameworks because then you might think this slide is busy, but, um, but all, these, all, all these principles, I developed frameworks in order to apply these principles to whatever context you're in. And those frameworks really are, are, are a language for communicating the underpinnings of strategy without which you, know, you get orders from the top and they're confusing or you're giving orders from the top and you're unclear, neither one of those is a way to drive alignment on the inside of the organization or the outside of the organization. So yeah, Ron, I, let's double click as I, we discussed this, but let's, let's really double click on the offense and maybe the Amazon example. And then we'll talk on some other pieces. I, I definitely wanna come back on the leadership piece. That's really fascinating. But yeah, tell us a little bit about e ecosystem offense. All right, so let me, let me, let me give you a, a snippet of, um, of, of, of an example I, I, I really find fascinating. Um, so kind of the, this, the, the mini talk I'm gonna give you right now is ecosystem construction drives cross industry disruption. And it's a story of how Amazon uh, took its Echo smart speaker and didn't just create this new space, but in doing so trounced Google, Apple and Microsoft who you would have thought are going to be the dominant tech firms in this environment of ambient computing. Um, so kind of the, the, the setup for this is people have been talking about smart homes for a long time, right? As soon as people put electricity into homes and found out how convenient it was not to have to use physical labor, somebody said, wait a second, I'd like to be even lazier. Maybe I can push a button and have this stuff happen with even less interaction, right? And you know, I don't know how many people are on the call are, are, are old enough to remember the Jetsons. The Jetsons was a cartoon from the 60s that basically predicted everything we have today, right? They, they predicted Peloton, they predicted telemedicine, um, they predicted, so, you know, this is the mom who used to like make dinner by pressing a button and you'd get a pill. We don't have a pill, but Soylent is like, you know, dinner in a bottle. I'm not sure that's particularly attractive. Um, you know, and, and we have, uh, you know, we have a Roomba cleaning up after you and Amazon actually just launched this Astro named after a character in this cartoon. People had this vision for a long time. And if you, if we, we think about the commercialization of smart home technology, um, the American Home Builders Association actually starts, sets out its first set of standards for smart homes in 1984. That's how long this vision had been there. And the expectation that there's gonna be so much value and so much money to be made in this context. Um, and then over the decades, we've had all kinds of entrants in there. We've had large companies, industrial companies, control companies, Honeywell, Johnson Control, Philips. We had, you know, Microsoft was, was selling home OS in the 1990s. We have the new version of this with, you know, Apple's home kit, Google home. So there used to be this industry for smart home controllers. That was one industry and it made a lot of sense. Then there was this other industry for speakers, smart speakers, connected speakers. Companies like Bose and Bang and & Olufsen um, and Sonos like came into being for, for, for connected speakers. That was another industry. And you could think about it as an industry. And then we had this other industry for voice assistance, right? Which was kind of brought into its modern being with Apple Siri and Google followed in 2012 and Cortana came in from Microsoft in 2013. And into this story comes Amazon in 2014, when they launched their Echo smart speaker. Um, and it's got this Alexa assistant inside of it. And what's interesting here is it's important to remember in 2014, no one was thinking of Amazon as a tech firm. AWS was barely a blip. And in terms of what Amazon's demonstrated capability had been was they had launched a uh, very successful ebook reader, the Kindle. They, um, they had launched a, a, a disastrous effort at smartphones, uh, which was their Fire Phone, massive launch, and they withdrew it from the market within six months. Um, and then they have a bunch of Me Too products like the Fire Stick and the Fire Tablet. That's their entire experience in consumer electronics. And here they're going to come with this speaker. And when the speaker comes to the market, it is regarded as really unimpressive. Okay, here, are like, here, here are three reviews from the time. Right, New York Times says, you know, if there's one glaring claw in, in, in the echo, it's that Alexa is stupid. 
she was human, you would have her commit. And they're being a little snarky, but they're being honest, okay? Alexa is not an intelligent assistant in 2014. And what's interesting is Amazon knows that. Here's the verge. Do not, I repeat, do not buy the Amazon speaker as a Bluetooth speaker. You can get a much better speaker for the price. They are right. It is a tinny speaker. It is a, not a good speaker. But again, Amazon knew that. And the, the most interesting one here is consumer reports that's saying, reminding us, look, Siri, Google Now, and Cortana are deeply tied into the calendar messaging and calling functionality of your smartphone, right? Between Apple and Google, that's 100% of the smartphone market. And Microsoft with Cortana is 90% of the desktop market. And by the way, the other 10% is Apple. So here's Amazon coming in as the company that sells you books and toilet paper through the mail. Who is going to predict that in this four company race, the company that will drop out is going to be Microsoft that pulls Cortana from the consumer market. The company that is going to be a distant second is Google. And a company that is like a diminishingly small third is Apple and the runaway success is Amazon. So the question is, how did this happen? And the, the, the part of what I want you to, 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 to appreciate in this is when Amazon launched the, the, the Echo, essentially the result is that these three separate industries collapsed into one, right? We saw this with the iPhone, right? We used to have an MP3 player industry. We used to have a phone industry. They made a ton of sense separately. And then they got combined. The industry boundaries collapsed. And you look back and like, well, why would you ever separate those out? The same thing happened here. And the key to understanding this kind of industry disruption is to recognize that ecosystem disruption happens not all at once and not alone, right? It's all about how do you align actors and bring them to to have them help you bring about this vision of the value proposition that you start with. So I'm gonna tell you the Amazon story using one of the frameworks um, that I've developed in this book. And the starting point for building an ecosystem is what I call an MVE, a minimum viable ecosystem. Okay, this is the, the smallest arrangement of partners and activities that you can bring together that will allow you to build the evidence that will let you bring on your next partner, All right? So this MVE idea is different from an MVP. It's not a minimum viable product. It's not how you test whether customers want what you have or not. This is designed to help you build an ecosystem, but what you're trying to do is attract partners. So Amazon puts out the Echo as an MVE and into the Echo, they bring in two assets that they have from these, their other activities. They only sell it to prime users. They only make it available for sale to prime users in the beginning. And what's interesting is, so when the Echo comes out, it has a voice control that lets you order things on Amazon, which hardly anybody uses it for. Um, it can tell you some basic things like the weather, but it also comes with prime music. Those who don't know, prime music is a second rate music streaming service. Okay, you've heard of Spotify, you've heard of Apple Music. Those are amazing music streaming services. Prime music, is again, I'm not being insulting. It is explicitly a second rate music service because Amazon went to the music companies and said, we're thinking of streaming. And the music company was like, great, we've got the contract we just signed with Apple and uh, Spotify, let's just talk terms. And Amazon said, you know what? Just give us the bottom half. We don't need the big stuff. We want, we just want music as music, something to work in the background. Which by the way, if you think about it is, is a perfect match a second rate music streaming service fits a second rate speaker. If you had a great speaker in the, in the Echo, you would want a great music service. And if you're insisting on a great music service, you're gonna be unhappy with a bad speaker. So what they put out in the beginning is this explicitly minimum viable offer that combines their work as well as the music industries and this prime music. And essentially they're giving you something you can put on the kitchen counter and instead of fiddling with a radio knob, you can have music in the background and not get your hands dirty. That's their first step. This is what's dismissed by the reviews that I showed you. The second step was they upgraded the, the skills, their, their apps for the Echo. Um, so they had their internal development team come up with 
again, really like silly applications, like, you know, like pre horoscope or, you know, predicting the future for a decision. But the, and the point of these skills is not that they were somehow going to change the value of the Alexa for the end user. The point of the skills was to demonstrate to developers that this is a platform that you can develop apps for. Once they have these skills out, they then launch their skill set for developers, allowing external developers to start building apps. And once this is settled as in, is in place, part of what's happening, of course, is we're getting more and more usage, right? So this is a cloud-based entity. And so more usage gives you more data. It's going to get smarter with more usage, right? Which is partly why you, you, you don't bring external developers in the beginning. But once you have these external developers, they take the next step, right? And the next step is to allow what's in happening inside the speaker to interact with other hardware. They open up a set of APIs and they create this works with Alexa interface. So now they can go to Philips and say, well, you've got these light bulbs. You've been trying to sell a smart home hub to control them. You can keep doing that, of course, but if you want, we have an API that you can use the Alexa to talk to the bulbs as well. Uh, the, the, the echo to talk to the bubbles as well. And then their final step, once they have enough hardware suppliers that works with Alexa is they offer essentially Alexa inside. They offer a $7 chipset that now you can put the Alexa intelligence wherever you want, separate from the echo speaker. So now instead of talking to the speaker, you can just talk directly to the light switch. Um, and with this, they totally transform this ecosystem. Um, and have aligned all these partners. Now, they're, 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 the, the, the one thing to keep in mind is, you know, well, so how do you, how do you get to be so visionary, right? It's like, oh my God, we look at this, we look at the outcome, we look at this alignment. And the question is like, how special must Jeff Bezos be to have been able to imagine this idea that you can speak, you can have this intelligence understand you, and you can have it understand you, not just in the room you're in, but maybe in other rooms as well? And the answer is no uniqueness whatsoever, okay? So these are pictures from a TV show called Star Trek from the 1960s. And by the way, if you missed it in the 1960s, they put out a bunch of bad movies in the 1980s, and then they put new series out in the 1990s, and then they redid movies more recently. And this notion of being able to talk to a machine and have it control things in your home, this is, this is not at all unique. Hollywood has spent hundreds of millions, billions of dollars showing you the consumer use case. What is unique is how you get there, right? And that's the, that's the trick. The trick is how do you craft a pathway that aligns these actors? Because keep in mind, if Bezos had brought all these partners together on day one, developers, hardware manufacturers, et cetera, and said, hey, we're going to do this ecosystem. It's going to be amazing. We're going to lead it. Can you guys just step back in line and do what we say? The answer would be forget it, right? Particularly as an unsuccessful technology player to that point. What you're seeing here is the construction of an ecosystem. And from this ecosystem, by the way, they're now extending beyond the home, right? Into cars, into mobile devices, right? Kind of pioneering this whole notion of ambient computing. So that's a story of alignment. Um, it's a story of alignment in the context of really severe ecosystem competitors, but it's also a story that is not unique to technology companies, right? I could tell you exactly the, the same story about that. Has to have the law company, the same pattern. But in, in a way, Ron, I mean, what you're saying is don't over obsess with just the value proposition to the end user. Yeah, you need that, but you've got to actually think about the whole set of partners you've got to you know, attract as well, not just the customers. And I guess something about the sequencing there. Yes, so critical is this notion, once you understand the partners you need and you understand that they need to be aligned, that they're not just gonna follow into line, the question of sequence is critical, right? And this is this idea of, of staged expansion that follows the minimum viable ecosystem. Okay, sure. Um, we're going to go, we got a whole, you've triggered a, quite a few questions. So we're going to go to Shruti in just a second. I'm just going to maybe short answers to two things that are on the dock. Just briefly, what's difference about defensive versus offensive? And a, a couple more lines on leadership in, in this brave new world. And then what, Shruti, you'll be up. Um, so when you talk about ecosystems, you're talking about coalitions. 
ecosystem offense essentially is how do you build a new coalition to do something new? Ecosystem defense means you're doing your thing and now someone is coming in. And so the, the key principle of ecosystem defense is you have to do it with a coalition, right? If you're doing it alone, you're doing it wrong, but you're starting with a coalition that you now need to shift, that you now need to maintain. Um, so really it's about what's your starting point? Are you trying to do something new or are you trying to protect an existing activity? Um, but the, 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 the logic of partner alignment and the logic of leadership is going to be the same, which is you can't just be thinking about your own thing. Very good. That was very concise. Shruti, why don't you um, pick a few of the questions and, and fire them at Ron, Ron one at a time, or you can group a couple if you want. Sure, sounds good. So, uh, Ron, we have a question from Jenny uh, Tobeka, which is a little bit about the timing that she spoke about. So she asked if you can elaborate a little bit on the timing of creating a new, uh, new ecosystem structure around the market offering, and how do you know what that right time will be? Uh, and then following, uh, it might be relevant, a bit sort of overlapping, is we also have the question around COVID-19. So how do you see COVID-19 disrupting the industries and what do you think are the long-term implications of this? Um, you know, I'll start, it was in COVID-19 itself is, it, is an ecosystem disruption, right? It's, it's actually, it's, I, actually I, I talk about this, this in the, the, uh, the, 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 the epilogue of the book, which is COVID-19 was supposed, a virus is supposed to be a healthcare crisis. Right, that was the industry was supposed to be dealt with. It was your health authorities that were supposed to fix it. And COVID-19 kind of crossed industry boundaries where it became an issue of trade, international relations, defense. And the, the response to COVID-19 requires the same sort of thing, right? And it's it's interesting that you know the even the, the vaccine development efforts that we had in the US, Operation Warp Speed. I think part of what allowed it to be successful was that it really was approached as an ecosystem solution. It was a collaboration between the, the, the uh, Department for Health and Human Services and the Department of Defense, um, which allowed for uh, a different kind of supply chain construction. Um, the government made very aggressive, proactive bets in allowing industry to make commitments to production before uh, drug development itself was finalized and approved. Um, so it's a it's a it's a it's it's a great case study in what ecosystem threats look like um, in the world we're facing. By the way, the same thing with the environment, right? It used to be that environment was smoke coming out of a smokestack, and that's bad pollution. Today, you know, the implications of global warming are we're flooding cities, we're burning down states. It requires a much broader alignment of actors in order to address them. Um, the, the, so the, the, and, and what it's done is it has released a lot of constraints at the same time, right? So kind of to the question of, of, of timing, um, when we think about timing, we have to think about not just what does it take to pull together this new ecosystem, but also what does it take for this new value proposition to actually exceed in value what it is that the old ecosystem is providing. And so the, uh, the discussion around timing has to do with how do we think about this competition, not from a technology versus technology or company versus company perspective, but in terms of the position be between the old ecosystem and the new ecosystem. And there's, a, there's a whole toolkit in place there. Um, the, 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 the one thing I'll, I'll, I'll put out though is um, and the, the, the two constructs that I, I found really helpful in my thinking about timing, because again, you don't want to, you can't wait until everything is done to say the timing is right now I'll start because then it's too late. So the question is, how do you make your investments in advance of completion? And the two constructs that I found really helpful, one actually was developed by, uh, by our colleagues at INSEAD, uh, Carl Kuhl and Ingemar Dirks, the notion that they coined in the 1980s of time compression diseconomies. That there are some investments that you make that when you when you try to rush them, they become more and more expensive uh, to, to, to replicate. So when you're looking at the possible investments required for an ecosystem, investments that look like they're subject to time compression diseconomies are the ones you may want to invest in earlier. The 
other is the concept I developed, which is the half-life of relevance. That there are some investments that over time, their value diminishes. But there are others where, that they will maintain their value, right? So the, the value of an algorithm tends to diminish because we get new algorithms all the time. Whereas the value of the core data that you can train an algorithm with, right, that maintains itself. So as you're thinking about when you want to act, it's not an all or nothing. It's, well, what do you want to do that underlies your action? And, and this is a, a way of prioritizing your investment in those actions. Nice, ni ni nice example, nice insight that the pandemic has shut, you know, diminished existing um, value propositions, allowing for more um, energy and more action on the ecosystem side. All right, let me throw a, a fresh one out at you. What do you make of the discussion in the digital industry about the metaverse, all obviously coming out of Facebook, but not just Facebook now? Is that too soon or do you see the time is right for the metaverse, Ron? You know, this is a perfect example of people focusing on an end goal and not articulating anything about how they're gonna get there. By the way, we saw the same thing with Libra, right? Who's gonna lead the metaverse? And if the answer is me and everybody gives that same answer, we know exactly how it's going to come together, um, right? So the, the, in, 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 in trying to bring together an ecosystem, Right? There's always the question of how is it going to come together? Are you going to wait just for like random particles to come together or is someone going to take the lead? And the person who takes the lead is not the person who says, I want to lead. Right? It's the entity that everybody else says, you know what, that's who we're willing to follow. And so the leader's job is to figure out the construct that allows it to make sense for other people who are looking out for their own interests to say, I'm better off following this plan than trying my own. That's what made that Amazon story so interesting, right? When Apple launched their home kit, it was an insult to 40 years of people trying to make the smart home. Like literally in their presentation, like, you know what? People have been trying to do this for four years. It's a big mess. We're gonna bring some order to it. Okay. And how many of those people are gonna say, that sounds great, I'm an idiot. I'm so glad you showed up. Right. Whereas you notice the kind of the, the construction approach was I give you a reason and I'm giving different people different reasons at different times. And as that room fills up, it's getting easier and easier to get the harder and harder actors on board. And that's where this notion of staging your expansion becomes so important. All right. Shruti, yeah, this is why I have you doing this. You have the tough job of picking out a few more of these excellent questions for Ron. The thing there is plenty of great questions. <laughs> Um, so we have Anna Maria uh, Pilati asking, which industries and which aspects of an ecosystem do you think are the hardest to disrupt? That's a good question. Um, so clearly, regulators can play a very important role in holding things back or in driving things forward. Um, and so the, um, to the extent that, you, that, that there are these external forces coming in, those are probably the, the, the ones that are hardest to disrupt, but at the same time um, can be quite brutal, right? That if the regulation changes, right? So think about, we've been, people have been talking about telehealth for 20 years. People have been losing money on great ideas of telehealth for 20 years. COVID came and in three, six months, suddenly all this happened. And it was because the regulators said, you know what, we'll pay for telehealth visits the same way we do in-person visits. And so um, I guess maybe I'll, I'll, I'll couch that response. It's not that they're the hardest to risk. There's no such thing as the hardest to disrupt. It's just, is the structure of disruption more gradual or more discreet, right? And it's probably a mistake to, to feel like, oh, I'm safe so I can, no one is feeling safe, they can go to sleep, right? That in some ways you, you but, but, but if you can, influence either for, you know, for more action or less action, the regulatory bodies, um, whether they're governmental, industrial, et cetera, um, that, that, that affects something in, in the pace of change. Sounds great. And uh, we also have a few questions around uh, small players competing with big players. So uh, one question is, so of course, you know, companies like Amazon, they have big pockets. 
um, you know, they're able to, to disrupt with the changing ecosystem, but what are the implications uh, for startups? How can they stay competitive, but also we have, uh, how can they stay competitive, but also stay aligned with their values? Um, so actually values are a really good way to align, uh, to, to, to identify and then align partners in an ecosystem. So I don't think that there's a, a conflict there. Um, I will say it's very interesting how, so Amazon is an exception in that not, a, it's not just that they're a big ecosystem player, but they've been very good at moving from one ecosystem to the next. The usual spa suspects that you have in mind, um, Apple, Google, you know, Intel, those guys have been actually very bad at driving success in new ecosystems. Right? So Apple's been very, very successful in the ecosystem where the proposition is a device that lets you access data. But in terms of you know, their hopes in payments, their hopes in health, their hopes in video, their hopes in education, or the list goes on, they've really kind of underperformed in their ability to move into these ecosystems. So there's just, just the fact that they're big doesn't mean they're going to be successful everywhere. Um, from a startup's perspective, um, the implication here is that you need to think really carefully about how you build your ecosystem, right? So, you know, it's interesting. Spotify is a great example of a startup that didn't have a lot of money. And their first two years, basically, they were struggling to figure out how to align the global music industry to give them a license to do global streaming. And what they discovered was that that was not going to happen. So they, dis they, they discovered in a somewhat inefficient manner that their MVE was not actually, we're gonna take over the whole world on day one. It's, we're gonna launch just in Sweden where piracy is so rampant that we can align, we can, we can get licenses for this one geography. And then from there, we'll develop the proof points that allow us to grow incrementally from there. So that's to say that one, startups have to play this game. Every startup you've seen that succeeded, I think, by the way, ended up following this kind of pattern, whether it was strategic or not. Um, and the, the, again, the, the, the reason for, for looking at these ideas more closely is because, not because you can't succeed without them, it's because I think they will make you more efficient on your quest for success. And that matters more to startups because inefficiency is how you run out of money before you succeed. Actually, uh, Shruti, if I may, I, one follow-up question, sort of the quintessential INSEAD question, Ron. How does international play into this? Just like in, in your example, either, are there certain going to be regions, now, especially as tech gets fragmented, are there going to be certain regions that are going to be better for building a certain ecosystem? But also, what about aligning players across cultures? You know, got a Chinese player, a European player, anything you're seeing or, or thinking about on the international side? Well, yeah, I mean, a, a couple of different points. It's always great to hang out with you. Always ask great questions. So the, um, if you look at e-commerce, Right? It's surprising how South American winners look so different from Chinese winners, look so different from American and Western winners. It's the same value proposition, but they were plugging into different initial contexts. And so what was required to align an ecosystem looks really different if you're trying to be Amazon in the US versus you're trying to be in Brazil and the whole logistics chain needs to be put together. Um, so that's one aspect of internationalism, which says, huh, we're not going to take as many things for granted. The other thing um, is that I think if you, if you can think outside of a dominant culture, like one of the, like one of, one of the greatest things about being at INSEAD was getting, you know, getting to interact with people who come in with different priors, right? And we all, you know, students and faculty alike, like discover where people are coming from, right? That's a incredibly powerful exercise in how to build empathy, right? And so empathy is, you know, it's how do you understand at, at a personal level, it's, it's how you understand and share in the feelings of others. At a strategic level, it's, it's how you can share the perspective of others to understand what makes sense to them and why. And that is the key to being able to find an alignment structure, right? It's not trying to explain to you why you're wrong. It's trying to understand why you think you're right and coming up with a solution that allows you to be right and still participate. Um, and I, I think that's the, so like the, 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 the ability to hold multiple perspectives simultaneously is critical for anyone trying to build these strategies or lead these kinds of organizations. And I think there, 
you know, so it's a diversity of perspectives, which is kind of part and parcel of what an international environment is about, a productive international environment. Sometimes you get in trouble, but hopefully the world will get better. Rudy, back to you. Yeah, so I mean, speaking of perspectives, you also spoke a little bit about stakeholders. We have a couple of questions around the part that customers play in disruption. So there's some uh, questions asking around, you know, what influence do customers have in how ecosystems disrupt? And are they even part of the disruption? Well, you know, in the end, it's the customer that determines everything. Um, I think where where a lot of incumbents have a, have a difficult time is they look to the customer very early, too early, right? So kind of that, that Alexa journey that I showed you, the first couple of steps from a customer perspective, it was not a good product. But the first couple of steps, the real intention of building the ecosystem is to get to the customer at the end it's to get to the partners in the middle. And so if you are evaluating initiatives using kind of traditional customer focused metrics, which often have to do with market share and revenue and sales, you're gonna end up starving your ecosystem ideas. They start out very enthusiastic and then we don't see the results because we're measuring the wrong results. Um, and again, this is, this is part of the this notion of needing a new language within the organization in order to be able to build these kinds of strategies. And it has an implication both at the C-suite level. It also has important implications in the middle of the organization where you're, you're thinking about how to do the work. And very importantly, you're choosing what work to do, right? Which projects you're trying to, trying to contend for. And um, for me, again, this was like, you know, the, the, the last, part of the book was really focused on, on, on the organizational part that matters because, you know, the world is getting more complicated. People are making more challenging choices. And when we, when we, when we're under-informed in those choices, what you end up with is like really good people putting out really good effort and being unsuccessful in ways that are avoidable, right? That's like, that's, you know, that's why I'm you know, so excited to to share these ideas, right? The point here is to make good people more effective in trying to do good things um, because, you know, because we need it. Trudy, last question from the audience. These are, these are great. Yeah, so it's, it's, more, it's a question and a comment, but I think it's a great one to sum it up. So we have Rajesh Gopal who asks that, are you suggesting that doing things differently is turning out to be more important than doing different things? And that's the lens that we should be looking at when crafting value props. Um, I am, uh, well, okay, first of all, I, I really, I, I, I like the phrasing of it. Um, doing things differently is more important. Yes, but I am also saying that because the choice of different things you can choose from is so much vaster, the importance of strategy goes up. Just doing it different is not the same as doing it better or doing it successfully, right? And this is, this is in some ways, this is the key. It's, you have so many ways of reconfiguring things that it requires more strategic focus to pick from that selection. Whereas within the industry structure, you knew what the supply chain looked like. So the, it's, it's, so yes, we need to do things differently, but in order to do things differently effectively, we need to be better at selecting that difference. And again, that's, that's the heart of what this winning the right game is about. There are multiple games and you need to pick the right one. And by the way, the right one for you, which may be different than what the right game is for your, 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 your counterpart. Ron, let's uh, start wrapping this up, but just a few things. So one thing, when I, when I met you 20 some years ago or whatever, um, you know, you were a passionate young tech strategy, uh, really into innovation and technology and then obviously still are. It, I start to feel like you're now focused on core strategy. I mean, do you, do you see the ideas that you're putting forward as this thing on the side or, or should we be um, elbowing Porter aside in the core for uh, some of this stuff? I, okay, you asked the question, so I will tell you, I don't know how it is defensible to not teach this stuff in the core. 
Um, this is where, you know, it's like in the 1800s, there was a time when like electricity was a special thing. And then there's like, no, this is just in the fabric. Okay, 25 years ago, this idea of technology was like a special sector. It was a special industry. Today, it's everything, right? And, and, and it was actually, it was interesting. As I was selecting the, the cases for the book, um, every case in the book is about a company that is either born digital or became digital and then had to deal with life, right? So like 15 years ago, 10 years ago, maybe even five, if you got lucky, you were able to say, oh, you know, you should, you should do digital transformation. And that was regarded as somehow insightful. Today, this is bread and butter stuff, but it turns out that the way you compete in this new world, it's still competitive. It's just the, the, the rules are different. Um, so yeah, so like partly it's like, you know, wide lens for me is like in retrospect, it was about how do you drive new initiatives? It was you know, strategy, but with a smaller S. This is strategy with a big S. This is how do you think about the value you're trying to create? Um, so yeah, I really, and again, I, I really hope this helps people be more effective. Any last uh, word for the INSEAD audience since you're uh, checking back in? Just, sure many old friends listening to you. <laughs> you know, what a, it's just, it's such, a, it's such an honor and a treat to be able to, to, to share ideas with, you know, people that I feel like I, I grew up with, right? Both, you know, you and, you know, but also my students. You know, I was a kid when I started and I was learning alongside them. I just happened to be in the front of the classroom. And so to be able to, and, you know, I've gotten so many messages from folks so supportive. It's just it really, you know, thank, thank you for, you know, thanks for the opportunity to share, you know, vis-a-vis -vis INSEAD. And I'm so grateful for the, for the opportunity to start, you know, it's in such a special setting. Um, so yeah, no, this was just spectacular. Right. It's great you. to see you, Ron. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for coming out during your launch week, finding time for the community to share. Super interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to connecting with you again and again. So stay in yeah. touch. Perfect. Peace. Thank you, everybody.